Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a delight to have Olivier with us tonight. This is actually a very special occasion because this is the 21st birthday party of the Centre for Economic Performance, uh, the 21st birthday year, I should say. Um, one of the best things that Margaret Thatcher did uh, was to have a competition for a very big social science research centre. Uh, at that time, we were a rather small uh, centre for labour economics, but we put in a bid um, and uh, we won it. Uh, and the result was uh, that uh, the Centre for Economic Performance was set up, um, which was covering not only labour and macroeconomics as before, but also globalisation, international issues, productivity, more recently education, uh, uh, communities and well-being. So we now have uh, all those programmes with over uh, 100 researchers. Um, somewhere along the line we won a, a Queen's Prize for Higher Education, which is not uh, loosely handed away. Um, now the centre is run by John Van Rienen rather than me, uh, who unfortunately can't be here today, he's in the States. Um, which means that I can tell you that he recently uh, won the prize for being the best European economist uh, under 45 that's awarded every two years. That's, that's a great feather in our cap. Uh, and of course, Chris, Chris Pizzarides has just won the Nobel Prize. So we've got a lot to celebrate, um, and that's why we decided to have this series of lectures, of which this one is, is the first. Uh, and it, it's uh, perfect to have Olivier uh, as the uh, launcher uh, for this series. Uh, he's, I was going to say, one of the oldest friends of the centre, I think one of the longest <laughs> uh, uh, in time friends of the centre. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, we worked very closely with Olivier on uh, the conundrum of European unemployment, and we uh, learnt an enormous amount from him. Uh, and I think it was 1987, Olivier and Larry Summers wrote a famous article here uh, on sabbatical uh, about why unemployment uh, persists. Uh, then in the 1990s, when the uh, post-communist transition came along, uh, Olivier took an interest in that and so did some of us. So again, uh, we collaborated closely. So, so many of the successes of the centre uh, have been partly due to him. And it's, it's lovely to have him here. He is now, as you know, uh, the chief economist at the IMF, um, and he's refused to tell me what he's going to talk about. Olivier. <laughs> I think there is no great secret about what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Uh, let me first say that I'm... Should, uh, should we just see if this is, if this is the right height? You probably don't realise how tall you are. <laughs> can, can, you, can you hear him at the back? Let's speak a little bit. Uh, we can probably do that. How is it? Good? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm extremely honoured uh, to be the, the first lecturer in, in that series. Indeed, uh, I have extremely fond memories of the... Uh, of the center. Uh, as I, I spent two long stays uh, at the center, and Richard mentioned the, the first one, which is the, the one that I spent, I think, a month uh, with Larry Summers. We uh, worked together, uh, ate together, I wouldn't say slept together. <laughs> uh, it was a very intense and very productive uh, interaction. We produced uh, the paper, which pushed the idea of hysteresis. I think at the time we probably pushed it too strongly, but that's the way ideas are sold. I think it's quite relevant to the current context again. Uh, and then the other stay was uh, with Stan Fisher. I think both stays were in, um, in Richard's house. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we finished the uh, book that uh, some of you probably have suffered through, uh, the, the graduate uh, textbook. And, uh, present a, a, gen a general apology to uh, all of you um, <laughs> for the sleepless nights and, and the rest. But um, it was, again, 
very productive. Uh, before I, I start, I was actually uh, told uh, to make a sales pitch, which I'm going to do. Um, the IMF is the most exciting place to work on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, uh, my job is not free. Uh, I have it for a moment, but there are many other jobs. Uh, and so I was told that uh, if you're interested in either applying uh, or coming as an intern, uh, you should definitely do it. Uh, you will have fun. Uh, there are more issues to deal with uh, than, uh, than, than we can possibly handle. Uh, with uh, these preliminaries, let, let me just plunge into uh, the topic of the night, uh, which is the state of the world economy. Uh, it's clearly a gigantic uh, topic. Um, I have four times a year I have to basically make up my mind about the state of the world economy because I'm supposed to know the answers and present them first to my board and then to the press. And that's actually a very useful exercise. And then, so what you're going to see is a, a slightly more academic version of what I would present. Uh, I have presented at the, at the board of the IMF uh, recently. Um, it is a very complex world, and uh, trying to get the pieces to fit is, is, a, is a very challenging uh, exercise. This is the same slide with the right logo. <laughs> <laughs> and we start. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on giving you the, the theme. Uh, and then you'll see plenty of charts and, and things. But I think it's important to have, again, a conceptual frame. So I would say a year and a half ago, uh, after the acute phase of a crisis, the question was, uh, what is it going to take to actually get the uh, world economy back on its feet? Um, and it was absolutely obvious then that uh, it was not going to be business as usual. It was not going to be the, uh, what happens at the end of a recession in which everything kind of goes back to normal and you just go back to the old path and uh, you're done. That there had to be fairly major structural changes uh, that had to take place. And uh, I organized the discussion with the fund. I think it has become fairly standard as uh, arguing that a strong bounce recovery required two, bounce, two rebouncing acts. And rebouncing has become kind of a cliche, but I think it's an important concept. The first one is an internal one in the sense of internal to every single country, which is that what happened in the crisis was a dramatic decline uh, in private demand uh, due to other factors, obviously, uh, which was initially compensated uh, by a fiscal stimulus, both on the spending side and on the tax side, in order to try to offset this decrease in private demand. Now, I think that was definitely the right answer at the time, uh, but that's not something you can do forever. Eventually, basically, private domestic demand, private demand has to come back. Uh, you cannot just have fiscal uh, deficits forever, and we're now uh, in that phase. So the first act is uh, internal rebalancing, basically going from what you can call public demand to private demand. Now, even if you do everything right here, uh, that's unlikely to be enough in the following sense, that uh, if, for example, you take uh, U.S. consumers, uh, you don't want them to go back to what they were doing before. And basically, they had stopped saving. Uh, this was very good in terms of aggregate demand for the U.S., but uh, you surely don't want this to happen forever. They were clearly uh, assuming capital gains on their wealth, which led them not to save anything out of disposable income. That was incorrect. So, even when you repair uh, what has to be repaired as a result of a crisis, it's clear that U.S. consumers should spend less. Uh, it's clear that the housing market, which was you know, overbuilt in a number of countries, especially the U.S., uh, also implies that housing investment is not going to be enough. And you need something else. If you want to maintain output at potential, there has to be some other source of demand, uh, which basically takes the slack. And the other source of demand which can take the slack is that exports. I mean, the U.S. came into the crisis with a very large negative net exports, a very large positive current account deficit. And it's clear that what is needed to sustain growth in the U.S. over the coming decade is a shift in which the consumers spend less and uh, we have a larger net exports or a smaller current account deficit. Now, if the U.S. and a few other countries are going to have 
a smaller current account deficit or larger net exports, there is this unpleasant identity about the world, which is that somebody has to be on the other side and have lower net exports or lower current account surpluses. So that's what we meant by external rebalancing, which is that the only way we're going to get a strong recovery in advanced countries is basically by a decrease in the current account surplus of surplus economies, which are largely emerging market economies, not only, but mostly, and a decrease in the current account deficit of the deficit countries, largely the US, but also a number of other countries. So you can see how these two pieces are needed and how getting back to strong growth everywhere in the world requires both. So we made the argument, and we said, well, that's the direction in which a country should go, and these are the policies that uh, they, should, they should follow. And I think the, the reason why things are not quite as good as one would have dreamed uh, was that this rebalancing is actually happening, but it's happening very slowly, and probably too slowly, uh, to sustain uh, a strong world recovery. And here... I list the, the three elements which are relevant. The first one is private demand in advanced economies remains very weak. Now, we've seen that some of it has to be the case. Again, U.S. consumers should not be spending like crazy, but housing investment, for example, is very weak in a number of countries. So private domestic demand is, is, is weak. External rebalancing, which is the improvement in the net exports of the U.S., is also very limited. Uh, the U.S. continues to have a very large trade deficit. Uh, so total uh, private demand, domestic and foreign, in advanced countries is weak. And the result of this is that when you have weak uh, private demand, you're a bit reluctant to turn off the fiscal stimulus to do fiscal consolidation. So as a result, fiscal consolidation is happening slowly, and that has implications for whether countries will be able to basically stabilize that later. So the slow rebalancing is really shaping the form of the recovery, slow growth in advanced economies, faster growth in emerging market countries, f limited fiscal consolidation in advanced economies. Now, that's the last point, which is what we have is weak recovery in advanced economies, stronger in emerging economies. This creates by itself a series of other problems which is that the fundamentals in emerging economies look much better than the fundamentals in advanced countries. The interest rates in emerging economies are fairly high because they are starting to overheat and are increasing interest rates to slow things down. In advanced economies, we're still very much at the zero bound. And so this makes it very attractive to actually borrow in advanced countries and uh, invest uh, in emerging market countries where the returns are large. And so what we're seeing is an explosion, although explosion is probably too strong a word, of capital flows from the advanced economies to the emerging market countries. Capital flows fundamentally are a rather good thing, and if people want to lend more to you, uh, in general, that's a good thing, but there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. And many of these countries feel that the capital flows they are receiving just are much too large for them to handle. And that's where you're seeing the talk about currency wars, uh, the talk about capital controls, the talk about protectionism, and so on and so on. These countries are clearly extremely reluctant to allow their exchange rate to appreciate a lot in response to capital flows. So the third is very much an implication of the first two points, the third one. Uh, but at this stage, if you read newspapers, much of the focus is on the last one. Uh, the point I want to make here is that it's an implication, one of many implications, uh, but uh, not the only implication. So uh, the, the plan of the talk is to run you through uh, the, this, uh, the, this theme in more detail, uh, basically by taking a world tour, starting with the US, which is clearly at the center of the, of the world economy still, then moving to Europe, then moving to emerging markets, and then discussing this, uh, this, issue, this set of issues having to do with capital flows, <coughs> capital controls, quantitative easing, which are very much in the news uh, today. <coughs> so this is uh, going to be four slides giving you a sense of the world before I start the tour itself. Uh, and this slide is designed 
to basically give you a visual impression, because unless your eyes are infinitely big, better than mine, there's absolutely no way you can read either the lines or the columns. <laughs> okay. So let me tell you what it does. Basically, it is a monthly heat map of the growth rate uh, in a number of countries. So uh, at the, on the horizontal axis, it goes from September 08, uh, kind of, you can think of this as the first month of a, of a crisis, to August uh, 2010. These are the most recent data you have. And then you have three groups of countries which you can't read, but the first one is America, so south and north. The second one in the middle is Asia. And the third one is Europe. And then you have uh, the last one is, uh, is South Africa. <coughs> Why do we do this? Why do we construct this? Because as you know, the uh, national income accounts come quarterly or annual in some, in some cases, but they come quarterly. We are not in the quarterly business. We actually need something at much higher frequency. So we construct, based on the available data monthly, we construct a monthly index. And then, depending on the value of this index, uh, which you can think as an estimate of the growth rate at this point, we basically give it a color. So if growth is very, very negative, then it's dark red. When growth is negative, it's uh, pink. When it's kind of flat, it's, uh, I don't know how it looks on yours, probably yellow, yellow green. When the growth rate is uh, the normal growth rate, it's normal green. And when the growth rate exceeds the uh, normal growth rate, it's dark green. Now, you can see what happens. I mean, you can see the crisis, namely the very large uh, negative growth rates in most countries uh, in 2008, uh, 2009. This is at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of the chart. Then you can see that it turns uh, first yellow and, and then green. But if you think about what's needed to get back to the kind of unemployment rates uh, or levels of output of the past, what you need is a period of dark green. Namely, if you've had lower growth than normal for a while, then to get back to the same old path, you actually need higher growth than normal for a while. So the logical progression of the hopeful pro progression would be red, pink, yellow, light green, dark green, then back to normal green. And as you can see, if you look at the middle, it's happening in Asia, in the sense that Asia had red and then dark green for a while, and is now stabilizing green. And these countries are roughly back to their old path. But if you look at, uh, at, the, uh, at, at the US, which is the first line, you can see that we're in the normal green after having had lower growth for a while, which means that in terms of level, we are far below where we would have been, and the result is fairly high unemployment. So what this shows is that the evolution which was hoped for, which is to get to dark green and then eventually back to green, is just not happening. So this is a way of just showing that there is a recovery, but it is not strong enough to get us back to anything like the unemployment rates that we had before the crisis, which is an issue. Okay. Second graph, uh, which has a bit more economic content, uh, which I have to describe for you. So first look at the, at the left-hand side, uh, US real GDP growth contribution. So what you can do in a given quarter, these are quarterly data, you can decompose how much of the growth comes from consumption, how much comes from investment, how much comes from exports, how much comes from inventory accumulation. And that tells you something much richer than just telling you the growth rate. If all of it came from inventory accumulation, that's actually not great news. If all of it came from consumption, it's better news. Now, the points I want to make here are the following, which is that if you look at, so you have two parts. You have the dark blue background, which is what we know, and then you have the light blue, which is forecast in each graph, right? So if you look at the dark blue, which is where we are and where we've been, if you look at how we basically went from negative growth uh, the white line is the growth rate, to positive growth for a while, you see a very large uh, contribution of the green component. And the green component is inventory accumulation, right? So basically firms going back to the levels of inventory pre-crisis and therefore producing more uh, than they sell. Now that's useful, but it comes to an end. And once you basically have gone back to your inventory level, that's it. So in every expansion, this plays an important role, but it fizzles out after a few quarters, and you can see that it is indeed uh, disappearing in terms of growth contributions. 
The other thing you see, although you don't see it in a very strong way, is that the purple is a fiscal component. And I think it gives a perspective on the fact that the fiscal um, stimulus was there. And for the most part, you get purple bars above the line, so contributions to, uh, to output growth. But you can see it's not quite as big. But also this, the important point is this is coming to an end. The US, like every other country, is not eliminating the fiscal stimulus, but decreasing it. So it, it has a negative contribution looking forward. You can see that the purple goes below the line. Okay. Now, so one way of saying this is we had a growth which was carried very much by inventory accumulation and fiscal, and both are being phased out. Okay. Now, the rest has to pick up, otherwise we don't get growth. Now, what we would like is basically from that export to carry a lot of, uh, 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 of the growth. That's what I explained earlier. Basically, the only way we're going to sustain growth in the U.S. is if we decrease our current account deficit, increase net exports. And as you can see, net exports is the yellow bar. It's basically making no contribution looking forward. Basically, we don't expect that net exports in the U.S. are going to uh, improve very much at all. What's doing it is consumption and investment, which are the blue and the red. You can see that they account for most of it, uh, which is good, but as I've explained, consumption is going to be weak for a long time. Part of investment, which is housing investment, is going to be weak. So it's just not enough to basically create the kind of growth that we need to decrease unemployment. Uh, what's missing, what, what, what this shows, is a very limited uh, external rebalancing, which is that net exports, which really are essential to growth in the U.S., uh, is just not, not, not picking up in the way it should. Uh, if you look at China, which is on, on the right, the first thing is you don't have good quarterly data on China, so these are years rather than quarters. Uh, but it's the ge same general principle. And if you look and you ask, is China helping uh, rebound the economy, you get a two-part answer, which is if you look at the last bar of uh, stuff that we know, namely 2009, you see that net exports, uh, which is the yellow component, is actually large and negative, which is in 2009, the trade surplus of China decreased a lot. Another way of saying this is net export made a negative contribution. These are equivalent statements. Uh, people thought it was good, but if you look at the forecast, which we have for 2010 and 2011, basically the yellow is not there. And what's, what this says is that at this stage, it doesn't look as if China is going to continue to decrease uh, is trade surplus, that the rebalancing we need is just not happening. And so you can see, I think this is, this is a fairly rich uh, slide, but it shows how uh, the external rebalancing is not taking place and the internal rebalancing is not strong enough in the U.S. to give growth rates, which we would like to see. So part of my job is to come up with uh, quantitative numbers. Uh, so this is our growth projections as of about a few weeks ago, and I don't think they would have changed very much um, if we were to do it today. Footnote, of no relevance to any of you except the journalist in the room. Uh, I gave an interview this morning in which I said that the world growth rate for 2010 uh, was between 3 and 4%. The danger in having my job is that right away uh, there were articles in the press saying the IMF dramatically revises down forecast for 2010. I made a mistake. The number was just not right. It's actually uh, four to five. Uh, so I want to correct it in case you have uh, some, some effect on, on what's written. There has been no change in the forecast, just a slip of the tongue this morning in the interview. Parenthesis closed. Let me now talk about this. So what do I want you to get from this? I, want, I think I want you to get two things, and there are a lot of numbers there. The first one is look at the, let's, let's look at 2011, because you know, in terms of forecast, but we're nearly there. So the red line, so this is the, the fourth line down, uh, gives you our forecast for 2011 uh, growth rates. And what I want you to, to see is something that you, you know well, uh, which is, the growth rate, which is forecast for advanced economies, the US, Euro, and Japan, sorry not to have the UK, 
the UK would be two, uh, is very low. I mean, it's basically uh, you know, around two. Right? And if you look at the growth rates for emerging market countries, Brazil, Russia is not the best example, but the relevant one, and China, and if I had added emerging Asia, you get growth rates in Latin America around four or five, and in Asia between eight and ten. So that's what I've shown, that's what I've said earlier, which is you really have this uh, dichotomous world in which some countries are really growing fast, some countries are not. So that's the first point, that's the unbalanced uh, recovery. The other point I want to make, uh, it, it, because I think it counters a bit the, the gloom and doom uh, tone of, of many comments uh, at this stage, uh, that uh, things are going from bad to worse, is I want you to look at the uh, red line, which is our forecast for 2011 as of October, so as of now, more or less, uh, to the forecast we made uh, in January uh, 2010 for 2011, right? Uh, and the point is not to, uh, to, to crawl about the, the fact that they are similar, but the point is that they are similar in the sense that what is happening is very much what had been anticipated, what had been forecast, as of nine months ago. There are no major events. We understood, basically, that this shift from inventory and fiscal to consumption investment would probably lead to a decline in output growth. And you can see that we haven't, I mean, there are differences, but uh, there are very small differences relative to, uh, to the numbers themselves. So what we have is this unbalanced recovery, slow, too slow in advance, uh, fast in the other countries, and not much change in the way we look at the world uh, since the beginning of the year. This is a slide which uh, is there because the question is always asked. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's uh, the most important slide. Uh, which is, is there going to be a double dip? Uh, and that's clearly a, a very difficult exercise, but we try to do it by looking at the standard deviation of what we do and then taking into, into account various measures of risk, of dispersion, of forecast. Now, if you look at the world, you basically have a uh, red line is our median uh, forecast, and then you have confidence intervals. Basically, the way to read this is that the probability that uh, growth, world growth is less than 2% next year is roughly zero. Uh, it just, it's going to be more than that. But, as you know, though, as, we, as you've seen, the, the world is composed of two parts, and so we have to look at the advanced countries. Uh, we've done it more seriously for the U.S. For the U.S., you can ask, what is the probability uh, that uh, growth will be negative next year? And our best guess is between 10 and 15 percent. So it can happen, clearly, and 10, 15 percent is actually, I think, the odds that the Democrats had to keep the House. <laughs> Uh, as, as of the day before the elections, uh, but it is not very likely. Okay, so this was the, the general view. Let me now move, start touring the world. United States, I think the, the dominant theme, if there is one, is uncertainty. Uh, it comes from uncertainty about saving, it comes from uncertainty about residential investment, and it comes from uncertainty about what is at this stage the main driver, which is non-residential investment. So let me say a bit more about that. So this is a graph which shows you the household saving rate uh, and has many graphs, so I have to explain what it is. Uh, focus first on, on the red line. Uh, the continuous red line uh, is uh, what we thought the saving rate of household was uh, from 1990 to 2007, as of 2007. And then the dotted red line, uh, which is at the end, indicates our forecast. So this is a pre-crisis uh, forecast. And the, the facts there were well known, which is that the saving rate had steadily decreased from 7.5% you know, to more or less zero and we believe that it would continue. We were not happy with it, but that's the way it was. That was the forecast, right? Then the crisis comes, and two things happen. First, the series are revised. I mean, history is always rewritten in economics because you get better data. So this is, for example, the blue line, which is the revised series for saving uh, as of 2009. 
the hard part is again actual data, which will be revised again, but for the moment actual data. And then we predict uh, the dotted blue line is what we predict as of 2009 for 2010, 2011 to 2014. And basically we conclude from this that the households had saved very little, thinking there would be capital gains, but in the light of the crisis they would increase the saving rate. They had started to do it, had gone back from now a low of 2 to uh, a value around 5, and it was going to increase to 8. Then we've got a new information, which is the yellow line. So the series has been revised again, and what we have found is that actually the consumers increased their saving rate faster than we had thought, and now the question is that of a forecast. And now based on many elements which I'm not going to go into, we think that the consumers have po probably more or less gone back to the saving rate they intend to maintain. And so our forecast, here I just show it to you for the next three years, is basically flat. And there are ups and downs. Uh, but basically we now don't think that people are going to keep increasing their saving rate. They're just going to remain around six, which means that consumption and disposable income are going to go at the same rate. Okay. The point I want to make is the dispersion. And the, again, the visual point is there are large movements in saving, there are large revision in savings, and there are large adjustments in the forecast of saving. And what the forecast is makes an enormous difference to your forecast of growth next year. And if people decide to go from 6% saving to 8% saving, then other things equal, the growth rate of the US will be roughly 2% less. Right? So we'll be very close to zero growth. And you can see, looking at this, that we can't really be sure. And so this is a major source of uncertainty, I think, in the US and by implication in the world. The, this may be the, the scariest graph that, uh, that you'll see tonight, uh, which is the state of the housing market in the US. Uh, so let me tell you what it, what it is. Uh, the purple bars, so this goes from 2006 to um, to the second quarter of 2010. The purple bars are the actual inventories of houses on the market. And you can see it's basically flat. It doesn't look like there was much of a crisis, and so on and so on. Okay. But then I have to add the other things. So this is the actual inventory. What this says is that there is an enormous shadow inventory, basically houses which, if anything happens to price, are likely to go on the market and therefore uh, prevent prices from increasing. <coughs> And the list is the following. The green is the mortgages which are uh, delinquent by two to three months. So they might be repaid, but there's a risk, right? The red is the mortgages which are delinquent by more than three months. The yellow are the houses which are in the process of being foreclosed. So they're not on the market yet, but they have been uh, basically <coughs> taken uh, away from their, from their, uh, uh, their owners. And then the blue part uh, is small, but is scary as well, which is that, as you may know, it has been very difficult to, re to, to modify mortgages. Uh, the idea was to basically reduce either the principle or the interest of, so that people could stay. So we have a number of mortgages which have been modified, but the evidence is that about 50% of these mortgages basically end up being delinquent as well. And so the blue line is 50% of the existing modified mortgages, right? which is what the expected value of the houses which will be on the market again. Now, if you do this, you see that although the actual stock is 4 million, the shadow stock is about 10 million. Right? So twice as big as it was in 2006. If I've not worried you enough, then look at the white line. So the white line is the number of houses or apartments uh, which are underwater and for which uh, the uh, value of the mortgage exceeds the value of the house today. Okay. That's another 12 to 14 million. People disagree on the existing number, but that's, uh, that's, 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 that's a range. Now, I cannot just add the 12 million to the 10 because some of these mortgages are underwater and the people don't pay, and so they're already included in the in the bars underneath, but to a large extent, this is a separate group. When you do this, you're closer to 20 million 
uh, uh, which eventually will have to get on the market. So I think the implication of this is don't expect U.S. housing investment to pick up anytime soon. Uh, and I think there, there's not much uncertainty about that. So where is uh, growth going to come from if we look at the demand side? Well, it could come from investment. Uh, and here, the news is mixed in the sense that all the factors which typically lead to high investment are present in the U.S. economy. Uh, yet investment is not as strong as would be predicted by them. So here, let me just show you, you know, four of them. The, the first one on the top left is the corporate net cash flows. And this, as you can see, basically the corporate net cash flows as a percent of nominal GDP are higher than at the peak pre-crisis. Basically, firms are flush with funds. Typically, this leads to investment, uh, but in this case, it doesn't seem to have that effect. The second is, the, on the going right, corporate spreads and rates look at the red line, which gives you the, uh, the BAA rate. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Now look, at the, look at the blue line, which is just the BA rate. As you can see, it went up a whole lot in the crisis, uh, but it is now down to a level which is much lower uh, than pre-crisis. It comes from the fact that the base rate uh, is, is very, very low, so although the premium, the risk premium has increased a bit, the sum of the two is quite low. So again, borrowing is cheap at this stage for most firms. The down left there is this thing that you probably have learned about, which is called average Q, which is the ratio of the market value of capital to a replacement cost. And the simple theory says when it's more than one, investment should be positive. When it's less, investment should not. Now, this is the red line in that graph. And the point I want to make is, is something that I didn't know before the graph was constructed. is actually Tobin's Q, which is measured on the left-hand side, is actually much higher than pre-crisis. And the reason for this uh, is not that the stock market has boomed. It has recovered quite a bit, but it's that the capital stock has fallen enormously. There has been very little investment. So again, this suggests that it's a good time to invest. You basically don't have enough capital. It's valued very highly. Then the last one is a measure of uncertainty, which takes into account various measures of uncertainty, which was built by Nick Bloom. And again here, it's not as low as it was uh, pre-crisis, but it has come down a whole lot. So if I show you this and I ask you, well, what's going to happen to investment? I think you'd be very optimistic. The fact is that investment is doing reasonably well, but not at all as well as these factors would suggest. It's something about firms which make them very reluctant uh, to, uh, to invest in equipment and software, at least, uh, that uh, we don't understand. Now, this gives you the growth rate of equipment and software investment uh, from 2009 to 2012, the red line is our uh, world economic output projection. Uh, the yellow bands are basically the highest and the lowest forecast, depending on which model you use. So how you combine these four factors you saw on the previous slide, how you put them together in a regression. The point is, if you look, say, in, uh, at the end of uh, 2010, so somewhere in the middle of, of the graph, uh, half distance from left and right, uh, you see that the band is very large. And the band goes from uh, a growth rate of 20, nearly 25% to a growth rate of 15 Now again, whether it's one or the other makes a lot of difference to the US GDP. Right? This is about 10% of the US GDP. So if, for example, there's a 10% difference in the growth rates, this leads to a 1% change in demand relative to uh, the other case. So again, very large uncertainty, many hopes predicated on this, but we're not sure. Last two slides on, on the US, uh, the labor market. And I don't think we can ignore it because politically uh, it is absolutely central. And, and, and for in, in human terms, obviously, it is. So what this shows is the deviation of employment uh, in percent from the peak, the pre-crisis peak, or the pre-recession pre peak, peak for the past uh, ten, uh, past six recessions, 
Okay. So the worst one until now was the 1981-1983 recession when Paul Volcker decided to increase interest rates and basically created a recession. That's the red line. After 17 months, it reached a trough. Employment was down by 3%, and then it went back uh, to normal after about uh, 30 months, say. Long time. Okay. The relevant one is for today is the, uh, the, the brown one. And you can see that we're just in a different uh, world uh, than in previous recessions. Employment is down by more than 6%. Um, the trough, if it's a trough, has been reached after about two years, and at this stage, it's just basically flat. Growth is just enough to maintain employment, not to do more. And this has really created uh, enormous, enormous problems. This is another way of looking at it. So this is the proportion of U.S. long-term unemployment. Now, as, as you probably know, long-term unemployment is defined differently uh, in the U.S., and uh, in, Europe. In, the Euro in Europe, it's more than 12 months. Uh, if we had done this for the US, the number used to be zero, more or less. So in the US, long-term unemployment is more than six months. Okay. And as you can see, this is something which gives you the proportion of long-term unemployed from 78 uh, to today. Look at the previous recession, look at the Volcker recession, so 81, 82, 83. We basically reached a level where 25% of the unemployed were unemployed more than six months. We're now at the level at which uh, nearly 50% of, 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 of people are, have been unemployed for more than six months. Again, for a country which is not used to it, uh, these are just uh, incredible numbers. So this is the problem of the US. <coughs> Let me now turn to Europe. Europe. <coughs> I mean, the title I've chosen is Mixed News, and I think that's right. And there's kind of this certain schizophrenia, which is if you look at the financial aspects, um, there are many reasons to worry, uh, namely the interacting uh, sovereign and, and financial risks, uh, very visible in some countries, but relevant for many others. And one can think of a unpleasant scenario. In principle, mechanisms have been put in place. Uh, Banks can basically use government bonds as collateral at the ECB. That helps. And uh, if a country wants to has a problem issuing new issue at a decent rate, it can basically rely on this new mechanism, the EFSF, and a standby by the fund uh, to actually get uh, financing. Only Greece has used it so far, but it is open to others. If you think about this, you worry a whole lot. The, other part is you just look at the real economy and you know nothing about the financial situation. And there actually uh, many economies, in particular Germany, are doing better uh, than we expected. So the question is how is it going to play? You can think of maybe the baseline is a bit higher than we thought, uh, but the risks on the downside are very substantial. So let me just tell you a bit more. This is one of these graphs which is designed to uh, make clear that things are complicated. Uh, but it basically shows the interaction between sovereign risks, uh, bank risks, and domestic and foreign uh, creditors and debtors. So the point here is you can, we can follow all the arrows, and all the arrows are relevant, uh, but uh, when the sovereign is in trouble, uh, banks suffer in many ways. Uh, first, typically the sovereign has to borrow at a higher rate, and typically this means that private uh, borrowers also have to borrow at a higher rate. Uh, the second is that the value of the government bonds on the bank's balance sheets uh, goes down, and that creates uh, balance sheet pumps for the banks. The third is that the promise by the government that it will stand behind the liabilities of the banks becomes less credible, uh, and we've seen examples of that. So the fact that the sovereign is doing poorly uh, clearly affects the banks. And then the fact that the banks are doing poorly affects the sovereign in many ways as well. The main one is that typically the sovereign has a very large implicit liability to basically help the banks in case something goes wrong. And it could well be that the sovereign finds itself having to pay. So it takes the form of contingent liabilities, but uh, this is a very strong effect, which leads markets to say, will the sovereign be able to actually uh, make good on these promises? If not, then it is in trouble as well. And we've seen phenomena like this in Ireland, where initially 
the debt level of the Irish government was very low, and yet the spread went up a whole lot. And the reason is that the Irish government had assumed responsibility for a large part of the liabilities of the financial sector. So although the debt itself was low, the contingent liability was very high, and uh, the uh, spread on Irish uh, sovereigns just went up a lot. Okay, so that's clearly the kind of dynamics that one worries about uh, in, in, in a number of countries in Europe. Um, a few, a f a few <laughs> graphs. Uh, this gives you uh, empirical evidence on the relation between sovereign spreads, which are on the uh, horizontal axis, and uh, financial spreads, it's not exactly banks, on the uh, uh, vertical axis. And you could have thought that maybe the two were unrelated, whether the banks are doing well and the government is doing well, two independent things. What this shows is uh, that's done over the uh, September 2009, September 2010 uh, period, so the period during which these issues have come to the fore, you can see that there's a very strong relation, which is that, for example, for Greece, uh, for this period, the average is about 700 basis points when the sovereign wants to borrow, and it's about uh, 350 uh, basis points if uh, a financial uh, institution, Greek financial institution, wants to borrow. So the two are clearly linked in very, uh, in very uh, tight ways. This was the part about the financial. Let me now move to, to the real economy and uh, make the other point, which is that, if you, again, if you didn't know about the financial data, uh, you might actually be quite optimistic. Uh, and this shows, let me just concentrate on, on the right-hand side, which is what happens in Germany. So this is a graph uh, which is of the same kind as the one I showed you for the US and China, which is a growth decomposition. Uh, and again, the dark blue is uh, what we know, and the light blue is what we forecast. So what I want you to look at is the last quarter in the dark blue part. So this is the second quarter of 2010. This is the last quarter for which we have data. Okay. And you can see that in this case, the growth rate at an annual rate in Germany in that quarter was nearly a 9% very, very high. Now, it's multiplied by four because we're talking about annual rates, but it's a very substantial rate. And you can see that even better news is that it came from all the components. You have no component below the line, which means that everything basically did well, right? The uh, net exports did very well. This is the yellow part, but fixed investment did very well. That's the red part and so on and so on. So based on this, I think there was a sense that Germany really was on the verge of being able to sustain much higher growth than, uh, than it had and uh, than other countries. Now, I basically want to make one point and then draw the implication, which is that if you look not at the second quarter, but you look at the quarters before, you see that there is enormous variation in the contributions of these various components. And so I think it is not inconceivable that, to some extent, this is just a case in which you know, uh, the, uh, the coin comes out tails four or five times in the, in the second quarter, and with just luck. And uh, if you take the view, uh, a longer view, and you look at the five quarters which are here, you say, yeah, that one was very good, but what about the future? So for that reason, we're not incredibly optimistic about Germany uh, going, going forward. Nothing like this 8% or 9% rate again. At the same time, I want to say that I think that Germany might actually be pulling away from the pack. Uh, Germany has had uh, a policy of competitive disinflation uh, for uh, nearly 20 years, basically. After reunification, they had become non-competitive, and year after year, they had low wage growth, uh, lower than productivity growth, they gained competitiveness. This was the strategy. It was very costly. Uh, they had 1% unemployment more on average than uh, their partners, but they did it. I think it may well be that had there been no crisis, they were basically on the verge of a very strong export leg driven uh, growth, and the crisis has killed this to some extent. But it's still the case that behind the crisis, I think there is something in Germany uh, which is different from the other countries. So I'm relatively optimistic uh, that, that something here is not pure noise, that something is happening. But it's m much too early to tell. Two slides. <laughs> 
tell, tell me how long I've been. I probably have been very long already. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, two slides on fiscal consolidation. Then I'll, I'll go to emerging market countries, where I think uh, many of your questions might be. How should fiscal consolidation be done? Uh, and this has been a very major issue until currency wars displaced it in the in the news. <laughs> This was the big issue, and, uh, and as you know, it has been the big issue in the UK in particular in the recent past. So our line has been that, yes, in many of these countries, uh, you need a medium-term credible plan for debt stabilization. Basically, there has to be a path which is credible in which the debt is stabilized and eventually decreased. Um, how can you do it? There's actually a number of tricks. Tricks is not the right word, but a number of means uh, which work, uh, rules actually work quite well if they are smart and have uh, escape clauses. The type of things which have been done for retirement uh, reforms, which is increasing the age over time <laughs> of the retirement age uh, so that nothing happens now but it happens over time, is a way to go. Replacement rules, replacing only part of the um, public employees who uh, uh, take uh, retirement is, is a way to go. There's a number of things which can be done. We think it is absolutely essential, and we don't think that it has been done to the extent that it should. Once you've done this, and you know the end is anchored, it's a bit like inflation expectation anchoring, which is, okay, once you have that, then you have more flexibility at the beginning. You don't need to uh, cut spending or increase taxes right away. You can actually do it more slowly, uh, as long as you know the expectations are anchored. Uh, what do we think of the current plans without going country by country? We think that most countries have done roughly what's right uh, in the short run, which is basically more or less a 1% reduction from 2010 to 2011 of a cyclically adjusted uh, primary balance. That seems about right to us. More would be risky uh, on average, again, and less would probably not be responsible. Uh, where are we? So let me just show you a slide, uh, which again may, may also be a, a bit of a scary slide. Uh, I should probably uh, tell you before I show a scary slide. Uh, this, is, this shows you the evolution of the cyclically adjusted primary balances by country. Uh, the way to read it is the green line is what has already happened. So it's the change from 2009 to 2010. And you can see that in some countries, because they were basically under the gun, the countries on the right, Greece and Spain and so on, have had to do much more than the others. Uh, but if you look, and some countries actually went the other way, Denmark actually had uh, an increase in the deficit uh, in, from 2009 to 2010, but they can afford it, they have a, a very low debt. The red is what they intend to do from 2011 to Sorry, from this year to next year, and in all cases it's positive, except again Denmark, which is marginal. And then the yellow is what they intend to do from 2011 to 2013. So the last one, which is these uh, blue squares, is a more complicated computation, but it is basically where the countries have to get. And it's based on the following assumption, which is that countries have to increase their primary surplus to some level, to 2020. Then from 2020, they keep it constant. And by 2030, their debt level is down to 60%. So you basically work backwards, and you get the primary balance which is needed in 2020. Okay. If I assume that debt levels had to be 80% in 2030, it would not make much difference. So th this is basically where we have to be at the end of a decade. And the point I want to make, well, two points. The first is the countries which need to do the most are doing the most. Greece is the obvious example. It doesn't have much choice, but it is doing it. Spain is uh, doing it as well. Portugal is doing it. Uh, but the distance between the top of the yellow bar and the blue uh, square is fairly substantial. And this will have to be sustained for another 10 years after 2020. And so there is a very long way to go. And these cuts that we have seen uh, are good, but they only go very, uh, part of the way and it's going to be a very tough uh, slog uh, to get there. I think we think it can be done, but there are political implications which are important. 
Okay, let me move to the, to the last part of the talk. Uh, emerging market economies. So here you have two things. You have what follows from what I've said, which is that these economies need to rebalance away from net exports towards domestic demand. Now, why do they have to do this? Not because to be nice to the world, although it will help the world, but basically in their own interest. The first one is they have lower exports to advanced countries, so they need to basically generate more demand, and that's internal demand. But in the medium term, if you look at many of these countries, they have very low levels of either consumption or investment relative uh, to what they should have. There are clear distortions. So in China, for example, the saving rate is clearly too high due to a lack of social insurance, problems of governance in firms, and so on. In many Asian countries, investment is surprisingly low, and that's the result of, of the Asian crisis. Uh, so there, it is in their own interest to basically you know, provide social insurance, increase consumption in some countries, increase investment. So they have to do that. Now, that has to come with an adjustment to the relative price, namely the exchange rate. So this has to come with an appreciation. At the same time, this is the second point, uh, they are facing very strong capital flows. Now, why are these capital flows going there? Well, partly because these countries are doing well, so the flows go to the equity market uh, or take the form of FDI, partly because of the interest rate, the fact that you, know, you can get 10% in Brazil as opposed to 0% here. There is a bit of hysteria about the levels of these capital flows, the notion that they are larger than they have ever been. That's not true even in absolute terms or in relative terms. They are high, but they are not quite yet at, say, pre-crisis levels. But still, uh, some countries are really receiving quite a bit. So what are the countries doing? Well, faced with these large flows, they are trying to limit the appreciation. So they accumulate reserves. And many of these countries already have more reserves than they can dream. So they accumulate reserves. That's very costly because reserves mean holding T-bills, which pay zero. Uh, that's very costly. Uh, they limit the appreciation. And increasingly, the talk is of capital controls. Uh, and macro prudential tools. So let me show you a few things. Let me pass on this. So increasing capital flows, there's a long lag be before you actually get the, the true measures of capital flows. What you can get monthly are the flows to the emerging market <coughs> equity or bond funds. This you can get uh, monthly. So this is what I plot here. And again, you can see, and if you look at the bond funds, you can see that after being negative in the crisis, people taking their money back to the US to advanced countries, it's now going to emerging markets and the levels are high. So the capital flows are there. <coughs> this shows how different countries have reacted to these capital flows. So on the uh, horizontal axis, you have a change in reserves as a percentage of GDP. And then on, on the horizontal axis, you have a change in the real effective exchange rate uh, and the size of the, of, of the balls uh, corresponds to total reserves. That's why China has a very big ball. And as you know, it has uh, $2.5 trillion uh, dollars in reserves. And as you can see, there is a wide variety of, uh, of responses. India has let the exchange rate appreciate quite a bit. 15% has not accumulated reserves. Uh, China has done more or less the opposite, more or less has pegged the nominal exchange rate. Uh, but the dollar has appreciated over that period, so it has a bit of a real appreciation. So it's above the line, but mostly has accumulated even more reserves than before. And then you have the countries in between. You have Brazil, which has done a bit of both. And the countries which have accepted the appreciation are not terribly happy about the fact that the yuan hasn't moved, because from their point of view, they are losing uh, competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis these countries. Uh, this is just to show that emerging market countries are not the only ones uh, targeted by capital flows. Switzerland is not an emerging market country. Uh, but it is a safe haven. And therefore, what has happened in the crisis is capital flows have gone very much to Switzerland. If they had let the exchange rate appreciate, uh, a night in Geneva uh, would cost even more than it costs now. And there is a limit to how much people will pay for hotel rooms. So they decided they could not let this happen. And so they have accumulated reserves uh, to an amazing rate. I mean, this is a very small country, and they have gone from, the scale is on the right, from 40 billion uh, to uh, 160 billion, so 120 billion 
accumulated in reserves during that time. The exchange rate still has appreciated, uh, but surely much less than it would otherwise have. So this is something which is affecting many countries. Uh, international reserves. You know, many countries have been facing this inflow. They have uh, accumulated reserves. So reserves are basically at the highest level uh, than they have ever been. The interesting thing is how little of it was used in the crisis. You see just a little dip. Uh, you know, in principle, this was there for that. It was used uh, in a very limited way. So reserves are accumulating. And this is the position of net foreign assets. So what you may be used to seeing is the current account positions, which is the flows. This is the integral of the flows. These are the stocks. Right? So above the line, you have basically the, the, net asset, the net asset positions of various countries. And then below the line, the negative net asset positions of uh, deficit countries. The point I want to make here is it keeps increasing. Basically, you have kind of the countries which have large net foreign assets are accumulating more. The countries which have, neg which have negative positions are taking even more negative positions. So no convergence to anything that we might uh, like. Let me turn to what one might want to do, which I think is, 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 you know, is the current issue, which is not the slide I wanted to show, this one. Okay. So what advice can we give, uh, or what uh, decisions can the G20 take uh, in the face of, of, of these very large capital flows to, adva to, uh, to avoid uh, currency wars. So I think I'll make two points. The first one is, that I've made about five times, is external rebouncing is needed. And so you basically need this appreciation of a number of countries if the world is going to go back to normal. And that has to be accepted by all players. It can take the form of a depreciation of a dollar, it can take the form of an appreciation of other currencies, but it has to happen. Let me show you one simulation which I find uh, to be very useful. So this is a simulation in which, so we have a world mall uh, which we play with, which is not perfect, but it's probably the best there is, and we do simulations. So what we do here, we start from steady state, and then we increase the US saving rate by 2% of GDP, right? So think, for example, of a fiscal consolidation of 2% of GDP or something like this, which would have that effect, okay? What does it do? We also do this in a world in which we have the liquidity trap, so the interest rate cannot help in basically avoiding the decrease in output. Okay? So you have a large decrease in demand. In the US, output goes down uh, by four. The multiplier is large because you can't use the interest rate to offset some of the effect. Okay? Uh, the other countries have a bit of a drop in output due to the fact that they export less. So this is a recession in the US and by implication the slowdown in the other countries. Then basically what we do is we say, what if China or emerging Asia does the reverse, namely decrease its saving rate by 2%, right? So creates demand, uh, and that's going to have an effect, a positive effect on uh, China and uh, on, on, on the rest of the world. So this is the blue line. So this is the experiment in which we still have a decrease, the increase in the U.S. saving rate, but we now have a decrease in the saving rate of emerging Asia. Okay? So if you look at emerging Asia, okay, the decrease in the saving rate creates a boom. That's a blue line. Okay? And in the U.S., larger exports to emerging Asia mean that the decline in output is smaller, and the same is true in Japan, and the same is true in the euro area. But that's not a very good solution because now we have a boom in emerging Asia. So what's needed? What, what's needed in emerging Asia is a decrease in the saving rate and a shift in demand towards, domestic, uh, towards foreign goods. Right? So the green line is a combination of an increase, in the, sorry, an increase in the US saving rate, a decrease in the saving rate of emerging Asia, and an appreciation of the yuan and the other emerging uh, Asian countries. And the result is that in the US, both the fact that we export more and the fact that we have depreciated vis-a-vis -vis Asia gives you the green line, 
So it doesn't eliminate the recession in the US, but it helps, right? In emerging Asia, you have two effects. You have the fact that you have the increase in demand and the appreciation. So you get the green line. So you're avoiding a boom, which they want to avoid. And then in the other regions, it's basically flat. So this shows that what is needed for the world is basically this uh, combination of an increase in the US saving rate, decrease in the saving rate of emerging Asia, and the appreciation. OK, that's the first point. The second point is capital flows and appreciation are part of the adjustment process. That's exactly how it should happen, basically. Capital going to the countries which are appealing, leading to appreciation. If it was that, and we stop there, then the answer should be, well, let it happen. Don't use reserves. Just appreciate. But I think what we believe, uh, both as a result of the Asian crisis and this crisis, is that capital flows are not always rational, basically. Capital flows and appreciation can be excessive. You can have irrational investors who basically go to a country uh, without having done their homework. Uh, on the other side, a very large increase in the exchange rate may actually create disruptions in an economy. And suddenly you have a relative price which changes by 20, 30 percent. The export sector is going to be in trouble in the short run. And the country may want to adjust slowly. Uh, the last is that to absorb large capital flows, you need a good financial system, because otherwise the capital flows go to the wrong place. And many countries don't have a very good financial system. They are not going to put it in place in the next two months. And so the danger in this case is that it goes and creates bubbles in the housing market or something like this. So for all these reasons, it makes sense that the countries would want to slow down the appreciation uh, and, uh, and basically limit the initial appreciation, get it more gradually over time. That's not easy, but that's clearly uh, what's needed. So just to go, to go fast, the policy implications, I think, of, of that kind of reasoning is that it makes sense for countries to use macroprudential tools and capital controls. They have to allow for some appreciation, but if it becomes too large for the reasons I gave, then there is an argument for using these tools. And then the question is, what tools? And we're working very hard on this at this point. At the same time, I think it puts some pressure on the large economies, namely the US, to actually think about the effects of quantitative easing, for example, on capital flows. Because it is very clear that quantitative easing is basically making carry trade, namely capital flows to the emerging market countries, much more appealing. And so is contributing uh, to these capital flows. Now, even if we think, as we think, that it's essential to use quantitative easing for the US, the implications for emerging market countries have to be taken into account. So the recommendation that we have at the fund is for the emerging market countries, accept some appreciation. But after this, you may want to use tools to basically stay there. And for advanced countries, when you do quantitative easing, which you may have to do, uh, take into account the effect uh, on capital flows. Whether this is what will happen or not, we'll have to see, but that's where we are. One slide, I'm done. Policy challenges. Uh, I see three. So the first one is it's essential to, although the focus is very much on external rebalancing at this point, uh, it's essential to strengthen private domestic demand in advanced countries. Uh, exports are not going to do it on their own. So they're you know, repairing the housing market, for example, allowing people to renegotiate mortgages is a first order issue in the US. Recapitalizing the banks which are not re yet recapitalized is absolutely central. So that's the first. The second is fiscal consolidation. And here I've said what's very important is not to do it right away, but to put in place some schedule which is plausible, credible, and which gets you there. And then the last one is rebalancing uh, towards domestic demand in emerging economies, uh, managing the currency wars. And I've discussed uh, what this might actually uh, mean in practice. I think these are the challenges that policymakers face. Um, and I hope they, uh, they do it. Let me stop here. And, uh, Thank you so much.
Well, what a masterly survey. Thank you so much, Olivier. Uh, who wants to ask the first question? We've got some roving mics here, etc. Yes. Should I stand up or is it okay? Um, thank you very much, Olivier, for this um, very interesting talk. Um, I believe you made some very good points, but it's not going deep enough. Um, I personally see a lot more issues. Um, you said U.S. consumers stopped savings. Well, the problem is the U.S. economy, especially their GDP, highly depends on consumption as a crucial element. Um, when we shift away from the U.S. to another economy that affects our world, and that's Japan, you pointed out in one of your slides that they have to make quite some impressive improvements. And what a lot of people don't know is that their ratio between GDP and debt is compared to Greece quite outstanding, uh, with 180% compared to Greece with just 120%. Now, another question so, that sorry, I... Could, if you could just make it a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm getting there. <laughs> well, um, the, the question that I had there is basically, now, when Japan is so, so much or so high in debt, uh, how is it possible that they actually lend $750 billion to the United States? How are we going to get out of this crisis? Because I don't see that happen. Thank you. Good. I think you one at a time. Answer each question as it comes. Or? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Yes, this was a one-hour lecture, a bit, bit longer, but uh, <laughs> uh, there, are, there are many issues. There are many more countries uh, that we could talk about in which there are issues. And in Japan, indeed, uh, there is a serious debt problem. As you know, there are issues about the measurement of debt and whether it's gross debt or net debt, but it's still the case that Japan has a very, uh, has a very tough uh, time ahead of it. Um, and I think that the issue which I have not discussed but is, uh, is a relevant one is uh, whether advanced countries are basically on a Japanese path. Um, and I think uh, I think they are not, but I think because we've taken different policies, but uh, if we were, I, I would worry. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why um, Ben Bernanke is so intent on doing quantitative easing uh, to avoid getting into deflation, because I think he has learned, and rightly so, that uh, when you get into deflation, it's very hard to get out of it. Um, so yes, there are problems in Japan. <laughs> Again, the 180% number is a bit misleading, but there are sales problems in Japan. And uh, it is important that, advanced, uh, that the other advanced economies don't get into a Japanese-type slump. Thank you. Uh, just a one-line question. Uh, in this new normal world, how would you assess the success of quantitative easing? Uh, maybe, maybe we should collect a few. Would you rather, Olivier? I'm open. You choose. What? You, you choose. Uh, okay. Let's have the lady in front here. Uh, just to make sure, you, you talk about quantitative easing, right? That was your question. Okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you very much for your time and this very interesting uh, presentation. I, however, want to ask uh, about the IMF role in implementing uh, more predictive and uh, uh, mechanisms in order to avoid another crisis such as this one, uh, especially regarding the criticism of some people uh, regarding the inability of the IMF to have seen this coming and implemented uh, sort of uh, mechanisms to prevent it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, can, can you just dig a little bit more into the US labor market mismatch, discarded workers, etc., etc.? Okay. <laughs> One of the problems of my job is I'm supposed to know many more things than I can possibly know. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, on quantitative easing, I think the intent, is, as you know, is uh, that it's going to be d done in the U.S. by buying uh, long-term uh, government bonds. And so the direct effect is a mechanical effect on the, on the long-term yields. And uh, I think we have some estimates from the first, um, from QE1, uh, which suggests that we might be able um, to get uh, uh, about 10 to 20 basis points uh, based on that. 
Uh, the question is how then it's going to affect the rates at which uh, people and firms can borrow. It's probably a, buying fi a fraction of this. So the mechanical effects may not be very large. Um, the psychological effects, uh, I think, might be larger. Uh, it looks as if uh, the announcement of QE2 had an effect on inflation expectations. And uh, I agree with uh, Ben Bernanke that uh, it's very important to make sure that people continue to expect inflation, that we don't get there. Um, there are more indirect effects. Uh, there is an effect which I think is not intended, but uh, will probably come, uh, which is that, uh, expanding on something I said, which is that if you think that QE2 is an implicit commitment by the Fed not to increase interest rates uh, for a long time, um, then I think it makes the risk associated with carry trade much smaller. One of the main risks of carry trade is you go into a currency uh, which has a high interest rate, you borrow in the low interest rate currency, and then in the low interest rate country, the interest rate is increased, and, and then the exchange rate depreciates, and, and you get into trouble. Uh, I think that that risk is largely gone, uh, and therefore this makes carry trade more attractive. The implication of this is that this implies more capital flows outside of the U.S. and presumably some dollar depreciation, uh, which is one of the channels for which it works. I think that you know we are we in new territory here. I mean, they, uh, ben Bernanke was very explicit about it. it has never been done on, on any on anywhere close to that scale. I think the idea is that there are some mechanical effects we can trace, some psychological effects we can hope for. Uh, is it worth doing? Yes, I think it's worth doing. Uh, because I think the risks are substantial. How it will work, I think we'll have to assess when, when we're done. Uh, on the IMF role, I, I was, there are two parts to the question. The first one is, did the IMF see the crisis come? And the answer is no, but I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, now, I think, I think the next point is, if I had been there, I would have missed it. Uh, because we were discussing it with Richard before, I, 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 I had not thought that the plumbing of finance was important for macro. If, if you look at my textbook, there's very little about this. I, I used to think of finance as uh, you have a, a set of term structure equations. So the Fed decides you know, the short rate, then people arbitrage between the one-year rate and the two-year rate, the one-year rate and the end-year rate, and it's a set of arbitrage equations. Surely there are little people behind this doing it, but don't need to know. And then the uh, stock market is the present value of expected dividends. And uh, this happens by arbitrage, and then there may be bubbles. But the notion that there were institutions, that there was leverage, and that it would matter for macro, I personally I completely missed. So it's a good thing I came late in the, in the game. Um, so, you know, I think that if it happens again in the same form, I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, but as we know, it will happen in a different form. So I think we just have to, you know, be, do the best we can and, 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 and hope that we will catch the next one, which will be different. Uh, on the IMF role, leaving this aside, I think that one thing that we have introduced, which is very important, is uh, a good answer to a, a systemic global liquidity crisis. And one characteristic of this crisis is that the number of countries which had done nothing bad basically saw sudden stops large capital outflows, and they needed dollars, and they just didn't have them. Uh, for some countries, uh, this was provided through swap lines by the Fed, uh, by, the, uh, um, by, by various central banks, but these were swap lines which largely went to France. Uh, if you were not a friend, uh, you may not have a swap line. What we introduced is something which I think is better, which is called the FCL, and now comes with a, a young brother called PCL which is a liquidity line given to countries which basically have behaved extremely well in the past and are in strong macro position. So when a country like this is affected by a systemic crisis, they can come to the, by a sudden stop, they can come to the fund, they get, in the case of some of these countries, you can get up to a credit line of 30 billion or more. Mm -hmm. uh, no questions asked, no conditionality. And I think that's very important. Uh, I think the challenge is what you do about the countries which did not quite well behave but are still subject to a sudden stop. Do you let them just by the wayside saying, well, next time, you know, you should have behaved better. That really cannot be because if you let them go, 
that might still lead to a systemic crisis. So we have to think about what we do to other countries which are not quite as, as well behaved. But I think there we've made a lot of progress. And I think that's an important uh, contribution. Um, on the US labor market, I think the, the big question, the big discussion here is in terms of you and you star, for those of you who have taken the relevant course, which is, is the unemployment rate we're seeing uh, uh, the result of deficient demand, or is it the result of structural factors? Clearly, if you think that the current unemployment rate is the natural rate today, then you're not eager to use demand policies because they do nothing useful. Uh, so the question is clearly a central question. My sense is that there is, it may be that the natural rate has increased a bit in a number of countries because of some skill mismatch, some limited mobility due to uh, underwater mortgages and things like this. But much of the increase in unemployment is due to deficient demand. So it may be in the US that we cannot get the unemployment rate through demand from 9.7 back to five, it may be that we'll have to stop at six. But I want to get to six first, and then we talk. Uh, the notion that the unemployment rate uh, today is close to the structural or the natural rate strikes me as crazy. And every study I've seen uh, shows that that's just not the case. And I think that we should release you. Um, okay. On that very fine labour economics uh, peroration, um, this has been a, just a wonderful start to our birthday celebrations, uh, Olivia. Thank you so much. I don't know if the uh, slides are going to be available somewhere. Sure. They, they will, we'll make sure there's a website, a uh, CEP website, which has got the slides. And uh, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. <laughs>